Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and uh, I'm here in Cincinnati, Ohio, in my parents' house. This is actually my dad's study, and I'm, I'm here this week uh, helping to take care of uh, my folks, and uh, uh, things are, are going okay. Um, dad is about the same, uh, for those who, are, uh, who know that story. And my mother <clears throat> is rehabbing well from hip replacement, uh, so um, I'm going to go see my dad again. Uh, this evening, he's got kidney dialysis today and uh, is, is struggling with his health, um, but he's a godly Christian man and he has a, a strong sense of assurance and <laughs> is praying, is praying to go to heaven. And, uh, you know, my sister asked him uh, two days ago, you know, what are you thinking about, Dad? And he just said, heaven, and uh, is excited to go, go to heaven. <clears throat> so it's a huge blessing uh, to me. Um, although it's difficult to see him in such bad health, um, it's wonderful to know that, you know, dad loves the Lord and, and even just, uh, sitting here in his study, I had to clear off some stuff from his desk, but seeing all the stuff, all his books and, um, different things he's got around here and seeing their fridge and all the little notes and everything that he's got on it. And, um, we had to burn a bunch of old junk. Like he had kept, uh, client files for insurance stuff. He, he sold insurance and did financial planning. That's what he did for a living. And uh, he had asked us, myself and my brother-in-law, uh, to burn uh, everything in his filing cabinets. <sighs> there must have been six or 700 pounds of paper. And we had to crumble it all up and we had it, I'm actually looking, I can see the, uh, in fact, maybe I'll show it to you, out there in the yard. There's the, the burn pit where we torched it all last night. And it was, <laughs> it took probably three hours to, to burn all that stuff. But we got it all burned and uh, I found um, a huge file of correspondence uh, that my dad, my dad kept copies of, of letters that he uh, wrote to a friend of his uh, who actually got in trouble um, because of some kind of insurance, something fraud. And this fellow ended up in jail and was not a believer when he went to prison and he had been sentenced to, I think it was 20 years. And uh, my dad had been witnessing to him for a long time and he came to know Christ while he was in jail. And I was looking, I, I remember that story. I remember my dad talking about this fella and asking me to pray for him uh, when I was younger. And I also remember hearing that this guy, while he was in jail, um, he went in to prison. He was not a believer. He became a Christian and apparently became a, a, a very godly, zealous follower of, of Christ and started leading Bible studies in the prison and learning. And my dad would write him letters and talk about theology and talk about God. And, and I'm just like, sifting through this stack. I mean, this stack of, of letters this long, of the, this high uh, um, on just regular computer paper. And, you know, just looking at the things my dad um, wrote to this fella, and um, it's just so encouraging uh, to see the things that he was writing back to my dad, and my dad was writing to him, and um, this fella had an accident. He fell down a staircase uh, in the prison um, and died while he was in prison. And I, I remember my dad really being, you know, upset that that had happened because he was, uh, I think he was getting ready to get out of jail and he was now a Christian and it was a wonderful thing. But, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, by the grace of God, that's the kind of thing my dad um, did. He was able to um, be really used of God because of the profession that he, he did. He was always around people and always meeting people and, um, and the people that he did business with, he witnessed to, he shared the gospel with and, and talked to about the things of God. And, uh, to see that pot, you know, we were, we were burning everything, burning all this old stuff <clears throat> that, you know, my dad actually specifically said, yeah, just torch all of it, burn all of it. I, we, we found a couple things though, that I thought we can't burn this stuff. His correspondence with his friend, uh, in jail. Uh, and also there was a, a folder marked bulletin board. And, um, it was, a there, there was a thing in there that I made when I was a little kid for dad. And, uh, <laughs> It had the, the score of the Bengals versus Browns game on it. They had beaten the Bengals that year. That was in 1987, I think. And it was also just, uh, I colored in all this stuff. And it, there was a picture of me 
uh, on there when I was probably seven or eight years old. <clears throat> and uh, I, I was touched that he, he kept he kept all that kind of stuff. He kept the stuff that I made for him when I was a little kid. And there was some stuff my sister had made, <coughs> pardon me, uh, for dad. So it was, it was neat to see that and, um, and just some other, other things that we found going through all these old filing cabinets. Um, but it's been a blessing um, to, to have been raised by a dad that loves God and, and loves the gospel and loves the Bible. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm truly blessed. You know, my parents uh, of son uh, could not have asked for a better father or a better mother. Um, and I am very, very thankful for, for both of them. I was thinking about some stuff. I've been corresponding with uh, some folks um, that I've actually met once in, in person. Wonderful, wonderful Christian people. And like so many that I've corresponded with over the past, you know, good grief. 15 years, uh, people are, are really distressed over the state of things in the church and over and over again, you get, um, these stories about things that are taught, teachings that are tolerated on the gospel that are just plain wrong, um, discipline cases that should happen, but don't happen. And, you know, no, no one's going to ever have a perfect church and it's, it's never going to happen. It's impossible. Um, Eve, Jesus even said, you can't try to uproot, um, the, the tares, otherwise you might accidentally uproot some of the wheat. But at the same time, there are things that are plain and obvious that are sinful, um, that the church just seems today not to want to call sin. And there's a lot of troubling things going on in the church today and, or, and what, what's left of the conservative, supposedly conservative churches in America today. And there's calls for compromise and uh, there's calls for um, let's have a bigger tent and, and let's, uh, let's be willing to compromise this and compromise that. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. Never, never is the answer. That, that's the road to full on apostasy. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. Uh, because those very same kinds of arguments were made 100 years ago and the mainline denominations lost everything because of that. But I was thinking about a number of different passages of scripture and uh, first Timothy chapter four, I wanted to read this and just make some comments here. The Holy spirit writing through the apostle Paul for Timothy and for uh, all of God's people through all the ages. Now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. I mean, wow. That's a, that's a pretty rough way of putting that. Um, so departures from the faith, these would be, you know, these are the, the essential truths, you know, what sin is, uh, who God is, how we're saved, and um, what the, the Christian life and uh, the, the doctrine of repentance and sanctification and assurance, the gospel, those great core essential truths, uh, people are going to depart from those things and instead... Uh, they're going to give heed to the doctrines of demons, it says. And you think, wow, um, do you ever hear uh, church leaders refer to <laughs> um, departures from the faith as demonic? Uh, because departures from the faith are demonic. They're, they're satanically inspired. Um, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Okay, so just just think think about how uh, how contrary to the spirit of the age and the this call to ironic peaceful coexistence with false teaching and, and everything else that that's going on these days. Here you have the word of God calling departures from the faith, um, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies. The people that promote this are speaking lies in hypocrisy. Meaning they pretend to be pious, but they're hypocrites. That word hypocrites refers to an actor, a stage actor. They pretend to be Christians and they're not. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And I'm talking about people, you can sit down and show them scripture and show them the text and it has no effect on them. They just don't care. Why? Their conscience, their conscience doesn't work anymore. It's seared with a hot iron. 
you know, I have a, I had surgery on my left thumb uh, when I was uh, 16 years old because I crushed it and had to have pins and wires and stuff put in it. And there's a, a scar on there I cannot feel that, you know, I can touch it. Uh, I could, you could stick a pin in it and it wouldn't, it doesn't hurt because it's been seared in a sense. And that's what these individuals are like. They, they, their conscience doesn't work anymore. And you think about how dangerous that is. Think about how important the ability to feel, um, not just physical pain, but also moral pain to have pangs of conscience to contemplate wanting to do something that you know is wrong, but what if your conscience doesn't even work anymore? What if your conscience is so hardened and so scarred over that it doesn't feel anything anymore? I mean, that's what this is saying. The Spirit explicitly, expressly says that this is going to come. <clears throat> People are going to are going to push the doctrines of demons, um, they're going to be hypocrites. They'll, they'll have pious pretensions, but they're really just pretending. And remember, apostasy only happens in the church. So these, these aren't people outside the church. These are people inside the church. The Holy Spirit says this is going to happen. From inside the church, leaders will promote demonic doctrines, deceiving spirits, and they will speak lies in hypocrisy. I just want to ask the question, why do we think that, well, maybe that happened, you know, when Paul wrote that, but oh no, no, that, that could never happen in our church. Oh yeah, it can. That can happen anywhere. That probably happens fairly regularly. And people ha have to be, especially the elders of the church, have got to be prepared for this kind of thing. They've got to be ready. Um, to defend, to stand up and defend against the lies that are spoken in hypocrisy by people whose consciences don't work anymore. They're seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry. Here are some of the things that were being taught back then. Forbidding to marry. Commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. How can you not make a connection with that and Roman Catholicism? I mean where they forbid their priests to marry. And think about the horrifying, awful scandals that have come to light because of that. And commanding to abstain from foods. You know, you know, here in Cincinnati, back in um, Catholic Mecca here, where everybody's, everybody's Catholic, um, you weren't allowed to eat meat on Friday. And so everyone would go to McDonald's and get a filet of fish on, on Fridays. And you're, the thing is, those are doctrines of demons. Forbidding to marry? Why, why, would, why would anyone ever forbid someone to get married as long as they follow the parameters that God has set forth? Well, <clears throat> you would only do that if you give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons and people who speak lies and hypocrisy whose consciences don't work. <clears throat> you know, the descriptions that are given in, in the Bible of the, the origin and character of people that push this kind of apostasy, um, they are so dark and, and they're so frightening uh, to read. And you just think, we're not used to thinking or talking like this. Uh, we don't think of um, the calls to, to depart from the faith or compromise the faith as, yeah, that's satanic, that's from hell, that's uh, hypocrisy, that's lies, that's someone with a conscience that doesn't work anymore. It goes on. Verse 4 of 1 Timothy 4. <clears throat> For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is re received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Yeah. You can eat whatever you want. You know, when uh, Ulrich Zwingli there in Zurich discovered the Bible and started studying scripture, taught himself Greek and, you know, memorized Paul's uh, letters in Greek, <clears throat> he realized that these Lenten fasting rules were unbiblical and they were a total violation of Christian liberty. And so um, in Zurich, they would have uh, open pit barbecues that you could smell for miles around um, during uh, times where eating meat was, um, was forbidden. And he, 
he wanted to make it clear, uh, we are following the word of God. We're following scripture. We're not going to obey these man-made rules anymore. <clears throat> so that kind of thing was happening here as well. Um, verse 6, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Okay, I, I want to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And so um, I have to expose and speak about deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons when they come up. And I have to point out when lies are told in the name of Christ, in the name of truth. When lies are told in the name of truth, it's ministers who have to stand up and instruct the brethren. Now that means that people are going to, uh, some people are not going to like you uh, for that and are going to think that you're a doctrinal hatchet man and you're just a big meanie and things like that. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. They thought the same thing about the apostles. They thought the same thing about our Lord. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. So if you're a Christian or an elder or, or whatever, just a, you know, a lay person, um, you are to carefully follow the doctrine, the teaching. That means something like the Westminster Standards or the Belgic Confession, or if you're a Baptist, the London Baptist Confession, um, or the Heidelberg Catechism, things like that. You should know those great confessions, and you should study them, and you should take them to heart. And, and look at the, the proof text. I always remember, you know, the proof texts, especially the ones in the Westminster Standards, they were never intended to be exhaustive. They're just kind of a stepping stone to see, you know, here's a handful of passages that it was never intended to be. Here's every passage that teaches this, this truth. <clears throat> um, but you should know those things. You have to carefully follow the doctrine. Because remember, the reason that mankind is under the wrath of God is because he doesn't have a correct knowledge of the truth anymore. Coming to God means replacing error with truth. That's what the Bible is for. The teachings and doctrines of Scripture have to replace the errors that we all have in our mind. And that's why Romans 12 says, In view of the mercies of God, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The way you think has got to change in your actions. Your life will follow. And the thing is, the, the better that you know the character of God, the better that you know um, who he is and the perfection of his love for his people and the all-sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ that we receive by belief alone, by simply believing that He what he did, he did for us, that's the key to a life being transformed. If we don't think biblically, if we don't think according to scripture and replace our errors with truth, then we're, we're always just going to be stuck in the mud. We're not going to make any progress. We're not going to become better husbands, guys. If we don't make a regular diligent study of the word of God, we're not going to be better at loving our wife. And ladies, if you don't make a diligent study of the word of God, you're not going to be better at doing the things God has called you to do in Titus chapter two, to love your husband, to love your children, um, to, uh, keep manage your, your house and to be discreet, chaste, good, all, all of that. <clears throat> we all have to make progress in that and carefully follow the good doctrine that we were taught by those that instructed us. And then he goes on in verse seven, but reject profane and old wives fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Okay. Don't get hung up on extra biblical silliness. Just stay focused on the text of scripture. Just keep reading your Bible, keep studying your Bible, uh, keep learning the, the truth, looking at the character of God, growing in grace every day. And then he says in verse eight, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So bodily exercise and be, being you know physically fit and things like that, that um, it says, is uh, profits a little. <clears throat> profits a little. It's not saying it's useless, but it only profits a little. But godliness is profitable for everything, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In other words, bodily exercise and physical fitness and things like that, there's no promise of life or of that which is to come associated with in how good a shape you are. And um, as you get older, as you get 
older like I'm getting older, um, you can be thankful that getting into heaven has nothing to do with how good a shape you're in. But bodily exercise profits a little. It's good. It's okay. It's good. You should try, you know, take a walk, do a couple push-ups. But godliness is profitable for everything. When I was in seminary, I took a class called Leadership um, by that was taught by a fellow named Alan Curry, Dr. Alan Curry. Brilliant guy. I learned a lot just from listening to him. I learned, I learned a lot just from listening to him pray. Like his opening prayers before he would lecture were, were moving. It was like everyone in the world disappeared and it was just him and God talking. Like it was just amazing to listen to that guy pray. But one thing that he made us do, he made us keep track in 15 minute increments, everything we did for two weeks, everything. And we had to turn it in. So you had to write down um, how much you slept, um, what you did, if you did anything for fun, how much TV or gadgets or screens you watched, how much of your Bible you read, how much time you spent praying every day in 15 minute increments for two weeks. I, I challenge, you know, the people that my, my huge audience that, that watches this, try that for a couple of weeks and look at what you do with your time and be honest. I mean, just be ruthlessly honest it, in 15 minute increments, here's what I did. And Dr. Curry said to the class after analyzing everyone's um, sheets, two weeks of 15 minute increments of everything we did for two weeks. He said, guys, it seems to me that almost all of you care a lot more about physical fitness than you do about private worship of the living God. Because the average was like five or six times more time was spent working out than worshiping God, privately praying and worshiping the Lord. It was very convicting. Um, the things that, that came to light in terms of how I spent my own time. And it was, I could see there were things that needed to change you know, big time. Okay. The passage goes on here. Verse nine, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Now think about what he just said. This is, remember, the Holy Spirit, this is the word of God we are reading here. Paul is saying to Timothy, to the end of uh, being godly, godliness, and holding fast to the true doctrine and carefully following the doctrine of Christ and the gospel and the true God and biblical worship and understanding God's law correctly, not giving heed to wives, tales and fables and commandments of men and the doctrines of demons and everything else. He says, to that end of trying to, to carefully do all of that, we both labor, okay, we work hard, we try to get good teaching out there. We try to speak the truth. And he also says, and we suffer reproach. Well, why would, why would people reproach you for doing what scripture says? Why would people heap reproach upon you for trying to carefully follow the doctrine and to, to be a, if you, if you instruct the brethren in these things, in other words, you warn them about the doctrines of demons and you warn them about liars and you warn them about compromise and you warn them about people whose consciences don't work and who uh, are okay with denying this and denying that. If you warn people about that, you're a good minister of Jesus Christ, but you also suffer reproach. What is reproach? It means people will not like it and they'll get mad at you. You're not practical enough. You don't preach seven steps to overcome your addictions. <laughs> You don't preach 12 steps to a stress-free marriage or something like that. Now, are there applications and practical things in Scripture? It's all over the place. You bet. But the, those things are the application of the truth. They're the result of understanding the doctrines of Scripture. <clears throat> Let no one despise your youth, verse 12, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct, in love in spirit, in faith, in purity. 
So Timothy was, was younger, and, and Paul's telling him, don't let people despise you because you're young. You be an example. Now, it's pretty clear, it's pretty obvious, people did despise him because he was young. And they didn't want to hear what he had to say, and he had to put up with things like that. And every, every minister has to put up with things like that. But he's saying, don't let it, what he's really saying to him here is don't let, don't let that bother you. Don't let people despise your youth. Don't let that be a reason that you cower or are timid or I better not say this because the older folks might, you know, attack me or something. Let no one despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, the way you act, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And I love the, the way this chapter ends. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, to teaching. Okay, I'm pretty sure that, that I, think, I think that's the Greek word didache, the teaching. You want to give attention to theology, Timothy. You want to give attention to the theology and the doctrines, the teachings of the word of God. Until I come, read. It's probably referring there to the public reading of scripture. Exhortation, that would be ex expositing scripture. Be, being someone who gives the sense of scripture and helps people to understand what it says. And give attention to doctrine. And then he says this in verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. You know, when I was ordained to gospel ministry, there's a change that takes place. There, there was. Something about, you get down on your knees and you have hands laid on you, and you're set apart for gospel ministry. You're set apart to be a herald of the word of God. To do that, that Greek verb, remember when I took preaching in seminary, que russo, que russo. Uh, you proclaim someone else's message. The gospel and the Bible are ours to proclaim, not to edit or censor or say, well, this is important, but that's not. Or we can, we can live with compromises on that. No, it's ours to proclaim, not to edit. Not to dumb down. Don't neglect the gift that was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership, of the presbytery. When hands are laid on you and you're set apart for gospel ministry, I remember there was a new sense of unction. There was a, there was a level of urgency that wasn't there before that. And I remember I had done some pulpit supply and, and preaching and stuff before I was ordained. But it was a terrifying, it makes, makes me get the chills thinking about it, being set apart for gospel ministry and just thinking, you know, James chapter three, you, you're going to be judged more strictly. People are going to be more likely to listen to you now and they'll, they'll, they'll believe what you tell them because, hey, you're, you're the pastor and you've done your homework supposedly and you need to know what you're talking about. And so the, the, the stakes are higher now. You're going to be judged more strictly and <clears throat> the the thing about being a minister, <clears throat> the, one of the things that has been so disturbing to me over the many years now, just some of the speeches, I, I remember speeches made um, when I was still in the PCA. I just couldn't believe some of the things that were actually said uh, in presbytery meetings by, by ministers of the gospel. That... I'm not going to, you know, get, get into the detail of them, but the, the willingness to compromise, the willingness to um, put people's feelings above the need to be clear. If there's ever been a time where we've got to be clear about sin and grace, the gospel, it, it's now. I mean, the, the need is always there, but when you have as much false teaching uh, that's coming to define even reformed Christianity today, the need for clarity is greater than ever. Okay. It, the need for clarity is greater than ever on the gospel, on sin, on the doctrine of sanctification, repentance, what all that means. He says in verse 15 and 16, this will, we'll close here because this is the end of chapter four. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. 
that your progress may be evident to all. It should be obvious that ministers, that Christians in general, are making progress. That we're becoming more discerning. We're becoming more biblical, more wise, more reformed <clears throat> according to scripture. Not that we're becoming more compromised or that we're moving away from the truth, but that we're carefully following the doctrine. That we're not giving heed to the deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons and people who speak lies and hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. We're moving away from that more and more towards the truth. And that can only come meditation on these things. You know, I, I think I shared with you that, you know, have, I try to read through the Old Testament, the Psalms, Proverbs, and the New Testament, and try to read, you know, a bunch every day, try to read a lot of scripture every day. <clears throat> and I finished the book of Acts and got to the book of Romans. And I thought, man, I've read the book of Romans so many times, so many times. And I actually thought about, I thought, I need to read first and second Corinthians, you know, probably more times than, than Romans. Cause I've read Romans so many times. I preached through Romans at 80 sermons on Romans. And I thought, no, I can't do that. I've got to read Romans. And it was awesome. And I, I can't believe I almost skipped it. I almost skipped Romans cause I've read it so many times. I thought, well, read it again. Give yourself to the spiritual disciplines, read scripture, read it over and over and over and over again. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. You see it again? Man, Paul, you're such a, such a doctrine guy, you know? You're just, man, you're just like so, such a stickler for stuff. Well, Paul knew that uh, heaven and hell were at stake and the glory of God is at stake. And if anyone ought to know that, it should be ministers like Timothy, like myself. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Whew, that's powerful stuff. Yeah, stay careful. Stay careful with your doctrine, with the gospel, with what is and is not sin. Don't listen to the world. You listen to the word of God. Take heed to these things. Meditate upon them. Give yourself to them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And that's what, what I want. I want people that hear me to go to heaven. And if they go to hell, I want my hands to be clean. And that means if you're a minister and also if you're, if you're a Christian and you're trying to, to represent the Lord and your vocation, your calling, whatever it is that you do, that means that there's going to be, there's, there's going to be people that, that are, that will be very unhappy with you at times. If you tell them the truth, a lot of people today think <laughs> in, in the name of winning people to Christ, we shouldn't tell the truth or we should avoid certain things. You just don't want to go there. You, know, you got to be real sensitive you know, to, to the people. And that's not the answer. Give yourself entirely to the truth. Make progress in the truth. Carefully follow the good doctrine nourished in the words of faith which you have carefully followed. Reject falsehood, bodily exercise, yeah, that's all right. Godliness is profitable for everything because it has the promise of eternal life. For the, to this end, we labor and suffer reproach. <laughs> yeah, you labor for sound doctrine and you labor to protect sound doctrine, you will suffer reproach because we live in a church culture today in America that doesn't want sound doctrine anymore. Why? The Spirit says, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. We're talking inside the church. And they'll give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons and people who speak lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So what's the point of all this? Why did I want to go through this? I just want to encourage people to remain and make progress in being distinctively Christian in the way you think, in what you represent, in what you say to people when the topics come up. And you need to know you're going to suffer reproach for it these days in our relativistic age. But don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Our loyalty is not to family. 
It's not to our spouse. It's not to children. Our loyalty is not to people. Our loyalty is to Christ first and foremost, regardless of the cost when it comes to human relationships. So remember that. Our loyalty is to the truth. Our loyalty is to the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ and to what his gospel is, that we are justified by faith in Christ alone, completely apart from our works, and that it's his work alone that saves us and gets us into heaven. Give yourself to these things. Give yourself to those things. Meditate upon them. Continue in them. Give attention to doctrine, to reading, to exhortation. Continue in these things. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Thanks for watching or listening.